Hi everyone, I hope you've had a fantastic Book Week Scotland. On Tuesday during Book Week Scotland, I had the pleasure of joining Carol Johnson on our live event and we were talking about her book, which is Mirrorland, and we recorded it to let more people see it afterwards as well. So sit down, relax and enjoy the rest of the event coming up next. Welcome to our event, um, guys, and I am here with Carol Johnson, and we are going to be chatting about Mirrorland, which is her debut book, which I've got here, which is a fantastic cover as well. And I had looked a little bit into you, uh, his, your history a little bit, Carol, and you're a prolific short story writer, and your short stories do sound quite different from Mirrorland. Um, I, having featured in things like the Best Horror of the Year collections and the Best British Fantasy collections and things like that, do you think that it's quite a big change to have written Mirrorland, or do you still think they fit into those kind of genre tags and things like that? Yeah, I I don't feel personally like it's a big change. I kind of, I understand, I understand more actually since having written my first novel, why books and writers get kind of put into boxes um, quite early on. Publishers have to know, I suppose, what... Um, what they're marketing or how to market it and readers need to know what they're getting I mean, readers obviously prefer certain genres over other genres um and so i think you know that's that's pretty inevitable and like you said i've been in you know best of fantasy or horror or sci-fi or whatever but to me a lot of the time the only kind of difference between all of those stories um, is maybe the setting or the the time period or or something like that. They yeah. they really don't feel that different to me because they're all psychological thrillers, and they all have the same kind of themes. They're all about families or relationships, lovers, friends. It's always about people who are in very difficult situations or perhaps trapped in a situation or a place. Um, it's all about how people interact, the things that they do. Um, and I also love having lots of twists and turns and reveals and stories. And all of those stories are, are the same to me in that sense. Um, a couple of years ago, I think it was a couple of years ago now, I sold um, a sort of long short story or a, or a short novella um, to uh, Tor Macmillan in the US called Skinner Box. And it was a story, it was a psychological thriller. And it was a story about um, a married couple, they were scientists, and they had a really awful marriage. And the, the husband was very abusive, he was, he was very cruel. And he was also very obviously hiding something huge from his wife, something really awful. Um, the wife was obviously very miserable. She had a terrible life and she starts having an affair with one of her colleagues who's an engineer and they start um, planning their lives together, their, their sort of escape from this, from this guy. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, it was a kind of precursor to Mirrorland. I mean, a lot of my short stories around that time were because obviously it has a, a love triangle. It has... Um, a situation that's quite extreme um, where these people are kind of trapped together, they're trapped um, and they can't really escape either each other or where they are. And then there's this great big secret kind of underpinning the whole, the whole sort of story. But it was marketed um, as a sci-fi because it took place in a spaceship and it was a spaceship that was slingshotting around Jupiter before it went back to Earth. And so, you know, I understood why it was marketed as a sci-fi because it's in space. But, you know, it, to me, it was just another psychological thriller. Um, it had exactly the same themes as anything else that I would, would have written. So I think, you know, in that sense, um, it wasn't that different. When, when I sat down to, to write Mirrorland, I wanted to write a contemporary psychological thriller. Um, 
but I also wanted it to be really gothic. I wanted it to feel like Rebecca or The Haunting of Hill House or something like that. I wanted it to feel really kind of dark and classic. I also wanted it to be a whodunit. I wanted there to be lots of kind of twists and turns and, and surprises all the way through. And then there's also um, Mirrorland itself, which is this kind of mm, fantasy world that the two sisters create when they're children um, underneath the house. Um, it's where they sort of escape at night from, you know, things that that I can't say because it would be a spoiler, but, but yeah, the, the whole introduction of, of Mirrorland as, a, as this kind of fantasy world also introduces an element of fantasy, you know, because it is, it's made up, you know, it's yeah. make-believe. So I think Mirrorland is lots of things, but to me, it really is just a, a psychological thriller. And I think every time I kind of sit down to write something, I just try and write something that I would like to read or that I hope other people would like to read. And I try really hard not to think about how it would be marketed or, you know, what, what kind of shelf it would hopefully be yeah. on in a book in a bookshop. You know, I try not to do that. I just try to write something that I think um that I would really like to read myself. Yeah, yeah. And as you see, Mirrorland uh, um is the kind of Sort of fantasy place. Uh, so as as well as the name of the book, um, it's set, set a, a lot of the story is set around Mirrorland, and uh, either in the past as the main character reflects back, um, or in present day as Cat returns to uh, Edinburgh from America, um, and to the old house that she grew up in with her twin sister. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit more about Mirrorland, the kind of fantasy place that that they that they kind of had? Yeah, so so yeah, so Mirrorland is um, like I said, it's like a it's this make believe fantasy world that the sisters create when they're children in the in this house that they that they grow up in and they, they go down there at night. It's underneath the house, um, and I sort of based it on all the kind of fantasy worlds that I read when I was growing up. So Wonderland and Neverland and Narnia and all those kind of places mm -hmm. you know I think that um, kids have really fiendish imaginations they, they like to think a lot about magic and things like that but it's always quite dark mm -hmm. and there's always like an edge of scary <laughs> you know um, like anything by Tim Burton that kind of thing you know it's it, and so that's really what I what, what my thinking was behind Mirrorland itself and the other, um, I suppose, inspiration you'd call it for for the book, for Mirrorland, but also for the book itself was my my grandparents' house um, in Leith in Edinburgh. Um, and me and my sister spent so long there growing up in the 80s and 90s. Um, it was it was kind of like a million miles away from our very sensible modern bungalow in Kerluk, you know. <laughs> <laughs> there was nothing like it. It was um, about 200 years old. It was Georgian. And um, it was really falling apart. I mean, as a kid, you don't really notice those things. You know, it's, it was just a great house. To, there were loads of hiding places. And it was just a fantastically brilliant house. But I mean, there was all sorts wrong with it. It had um, it had no central heating. I remember the roof leaked everywhere. There were buckets all over the place. Um, there was something wrong with the cellar, and you weren't allowed to go anywhere near that part of the house at Ooh. all. <laughs> but the but the actual house itself was great. It was really really um, eccentric. On the um, the front kind of couple of pages of Mirrorland, there are there are. Um, floor plans um, of the, the ground floor and the first floor um, of the house in the novel. And um, there are, oh, <laughs> you're going to do it just. Can you see where you find it quickly? <laughs> there we go. Right at the beginning. There we go. <laughs> it's a very really exact, um, pretty much how I remember my grandparents' house. So the layout is exactly the same. And a lot of the elements that I used in Mirrorland are exactly the same as well. Um, I remember every every room was just crammed full of mismatched 
antique furniture. You couldn't move for, for stuff. And every, every wall was covered in these little burnt china plates and pictures and things like that. You <laughs> Half the time you couldn't even see the wall. Um, they had this really old art deco bar in the drawing room and they had um, a kind of uh, one of those old servant bell pool systems. It was actually um, Victorian, so it was electronic and it was bell pushes in each room. Um, but in Mirrorland, I decided to make it like um, the ones in Downton Abbey, you know, where you have the bell pool in all the bedrooms. And then you have this great big display of bells on the wall in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. um, because it's, I mean, they're just, they're, they're great if you're children, but they're also such a weird concept. The fact <laughs> that someone would sort of ring these bells and somebody in the kitchen would go, oh, I must go and see what this person <laughs> wants. You know, um, even outside the back garden is exactly the same. Um, there was an orchard and there were really high walls. It was the kind of garden you couldn't get out of. There was no gate, there was no, there was no exit. Um, there was an old um, apple tree called Old Fred, which is also in the book. And even um, the kind of components of Mirrorland itself um, is very similar to a den that we had when we were kids at my grandparents' house where you had this kind of stonewash house on the edge of the back garden. Um, and it led into this long alleyway that ran along the side of the house. Um, and it had a kind of wooden roof over the top of it. And when I was thinking about writing the book um, and I thought, oh, I'll just set it in my grandparents' house. Um, I thought, well, how are they going to get down to this place? How are they going to get down to Mirrorland? And then I remembered that in my grandparents' house, there was this, um, this room at the back of the house. It was almost under the stairs, um, but it was kind of along a wee bit. And it was called the sewing room. And it was where my grand had all her mending. And um, it was a really long, dark, cold, small room right at the back of the house. And um, at the very end of this room, there was this massive cupboard, this big, huge wooden cupboard that you could climb up into if you were a kid. And it was my favourite place for when we played sardines. You know, you, you always used to have to have quite a big hiding place <laughs> so other people could hide with you. <laughs> and it was my favourite, my favourite place. And I, I remember hiding in it all the time. But people hardly ever found me because it was the kind of room that you forgot existed. It was just, it was more <laughs> like a cupboard, really, a really long yeah. cupboard. So I'd spend ages in there sometimes. And I always remembered that in the back wall of this cupboard, there was a full-sized door. Um, and it was very sort of clear, it's a very clear memory to me. It was this, this big white four pan vertical panel door uh, with a ceramic handle that kind of rattled when you turned it and it was always locked. And I remember as a kid always thinking, oh, one day this is going to be open, you know. And I also knew that it was the the, the side of the house. This was the, the bit of the house that went into this alleyway that we used to play in. And the, the back of the house was kind of raised up. It was about eight feet off the ground because the whole house was built on a slope. So the back of the house was on the lower part of the slope. So I also knew that the store was about eight to ten feet off the ground. You know, it was it couldn't go anywhere it was you know I didn't know why it was there and um, when I was thinking about writing Mirrorland I thought oh, well why don't I just have this door because it's above the alleyway anyway have steps that goes that go down into to this alleyway and the, the wash house and I remember talking to mum about it and sort of telling her my ideas for the book and that's the house she grew up in um, mm -hmm. and she said to me oh you know, there was never a door in the back of that cupboard. Why would there be a door in the back of the cupboard? That doesn't make any kind of sense whatsoever. And I remember the moment she told me, it was only a few years ago, being really kind of horrified that there had been no door. And then really horrified at the fact that I'd always believed that there had been a door, even though it makes no sense. <laughs> you know, it made perfect sense when I was a kid, but it, as an adult, Surely I should have questioned it, but I didn't. You know, I just thought I'll just use this in my book. And that really was the kind of final, I don't know, plot piece um, for Mirrorland was this idea of how your memories 
are quite often completely false and especially the memories that you you make in your childhood you know every time you remember something you change it you overwrite it and then the next time you remember it you remember that sort of overwritten memory it's not the same and if it's a memory that's considered I don't know one of your bigger memories one of your core memories and you you Mm. think of it over and over and over again it's rewritten over and over and over again and and depending on why you're remembering it you know if you're upset or if you're if you're happy or or, you know for whatever reasons that's how you will change it you know change it in that sort of emotion and so it was really interesting um if you look at somebody who has had a very weird childhood or a very bad childhood a very traumatic childhood sometimes if the associate fantasy with that already um, that completely warps their memories of what happened and they will completely believe things that if they were to be honest with themselves make absolutely no sense whatsoever yeah it's funny you mentioned about granny's houses and stuff like because my gran had a, a a, a, a cupboard kind of like the one you're describing and, the, and it's one of those things that you're always never allowed in it and, yeah. and you always kind of wanted in it as a child so I think it must be just a granny house thing that there's always a <laughs> yeah, like cupboard that you're not cover. allowed in yeah, but I bet there's a mirror land in every, every granny's house somewhere. <laughs> um, a little bit about the story um, Kat's twin sister Elle goes missing very early you find that out very early on in the story, um, everyone assumes that she's dead in a boating accident, except for Kat, that is. Um, and she is convinced that she is still alive. And she starts to receive messages that she believes is from Elle. And that starts her on a bit of a treasure hunt, doesn't it? Into the, into the past to kind of find, more, find out about her memories that like we were just saying. I think I sort of... I thought I'll use the treasure hunt um, because the treasure hunt's a really good way of, well, for a start, it's something that me and, and my wee sister always did when we were kids. Um, it's quite a, a kiddie thing to do. And also it's a really good way of giving information piecemeal, you know, bit by bit, because with each clue, you can sort of give a little bit more information, both to Kat, but also to the reader. Um, you know, when when Kat comes back to the house, back to Scotland from LA, she doesn't want to be there. She's only there because Elle has gone missing. Um, they're estranged. They haven't spoken for 12 years, but obviously she has to find out, you know, what's happened to her. She can't not come, but she doesn't mm. want to be there. And she's in, I don't know, I suppose, deep denial about everything, about um, their childhood, about what happened in that house, um, about what's happened between her and her sister, why they don't talk anymore, um, what's happened between her and Ross, because there is a, a big history between her and and, and Elle's husband, Ross. Um, and she really doesn't want to face any of those things. She's kind of there, but she's not there. Mm-hmm. And I thought the only way that I could get her to confront all the things that she's just determined not to confront is to give her more of her childhood. You know, she's already in a house that she's really scared of. Um, She's already in a situation she doesn't want to be in. So to give her more of her childhood in the shape of a treasure hunt, but also in terms of all the clues, the clues always lead to um, a diary extract from, from Elle's diary growing up. So each clue kind of bombards her with more um, more memories that she has to kind of confront and everything is always driving her towards Mirrorland, towards this kind of fantasy land that they created under the house because that's what she's scared of the most um, that's what she doesn't want to confront the most but it's what she has to do because it's it's in Mirrorland that she'll I don't know, she'll, she'll find out the truth about their childhood and uh, about their adolescence and about their their lives really and and obviously finally what's actually happened um to Elle herself hmm. and so now we'll find a little bit more about the book a little bit as well it seems like a good time for me to have a little bit of re- a reading from the book if you don't mind 
Carol, so what yes. would you like to do a little reading for us? I will, I will. Um, it's a really hard book to do readings from. I get, I get asked to <laughs> do readings quite a lot and I always think, oh, I don't know what to do because there are lots of twists through it. And yeah. um, there's, a, there's a really big one about halfway through. So it means that anything after that point is pretty much a complete no go. It's just really, <laughs> yeah, spoilers. So um, it's going to be uh, chapter five, um, which is when Kat's been back at the house, uh, I think about a day. Um, Elle's been missing two or three days by that point. And this is the, the moment at which she finds the first clue um, that Elle has, has left, or she believes Elle has left. And it, it leads her to, to the first sort of diary extract um, of Elle's. Okay. So. Ooh. Elle had the clues and I followed them. Tiny little squares of paper scrawled with cryptic messages only I had a hope of understanding. She tied them anywhere and everywhere, each little square of paper leading to the next, and only at the last one would there be a prize instead, almost always a drawing or painting of us that I'd pinned to the walls of the Kakadu jungle like a totem. Old Fred looks the same, squat and wide and appleless, his branches low and inviting. I walk around him to where Elle carved our names into his trunk and breathe in the cold, sharp air when I see they're still there, scored deep into the brittle bark, hardly faded. Not inside a heart, but a circle. I reach out to touch them and then snatch my hand back when I see what's been carved beneath. Dig. I stand for a moment, glance up at the house's empty windows, and then something halfway between hope and frustration makes me obey. It doesn't take much digging around the roots to find something, a deep hole covered over with leaves and loose earth. When my fingers touch something solid, I pull it out, a shoebox. I lift up its lid slowly. I see the empty bottle first, a pirate grinning at me, standing with one foot on a barrel, one hand on his cutlass, Captain Morgan's spiced gold rum. Next to it are unopened tins of food, Careful neat stacks of them, tomatoes, baked beans, sweet corn. Immediately I think of mum supervising the six monthly restocking of the survival pack stored under our bed. Black canvas rucksacks stuffed with non-perishable food and bottles of water. I think of her forcing us to run through the house on endless fire drills, intruder drills, nuclear war drills, refueling our panic, that ever-present hum of doom. There's also a tin of paint, a tester pot. I pick it up, turn it around, blood red. I drop it back into the box as if it's hot. It lands on a tiny square of folded paper. My heart is beating fast when I take it out, open it up. 12th of November, 1993, aged seven and a bit. There's a monster in our house at night. Not every night, but lots of them. He has a blue beard and is so very frightful and ugly that old ladies should hide from him and never venture to get into his company. That's what mum says. It's from a book. She says Bluebeard and Blackbeard are brothers. She says Bluebeard lives on land and Blackbeard lives on sea and Bluebeard is worse. But I'm more scared of Blackbeard because he's a pirate and Bluebeard is just a man. I hear a sound like a bird cry press my hand against my mouth when I realise it's me. My fingers are shaking, my breath feels hot. I can see Elle half slumped over her desk, diary open, elbows wide, brow, fur brow furrowed in concentration as she writes slowly in that same careful cursive. I get up quickly, start carrying the shoebox back towards the house. My heartbeat is inside my throat and temples. I slow when I reach the paving, glance across at the wash house and its chained door, stop when I see another flash of red in the corner of my eye, turn back to face that flanking high wall seamed with moss and lichen instead of clematis or ivy. Nothing. But when I close my eyes, I imagine the words splashed across that naked old stone in blood. He knows. 
Moonlight, I think. There should be moonlight. And then I'm running up the stairs and back into the scullery, turning that huge rusty key behind me before shoving the shoebox into the nearest cupboard. I go back into the kitchen, look up at the bell board, at the bell and pendulum below the number three. Imagine that gloomy thin corridor above my head, the dusty dark panels of the door at its end. Mum's sour breath in her skin, the snap of her teeth. You ever go in there and I'll have both your guts for garters. Because bedroom three was Bluebeard's room. Because the bodies of his wives hung on hooks from the walls and it was filled with blood. Because at night when he was hungry, he prowled the corridors and rooms looking for more. I go suddenly cold. The thought, memory, is as certain as it is obscure. The why that itches under my skin. And in the wake of that memory comes another. I look back at the billboard, the faded pantry. Elle and I hid from most of the house's ghosts and monsters inside the clown cafe. But we always, always hid from Bluebeard inside Mirrorland. The pantry is at the very rear of the hallway crouching in the shadows opposite the stairwell's flank and hidden from view by a black velveteen curtain. I pull it open. It's heavy, dusty. The rattle of metal rings against its rail make me want to cringe and fills me with a sense of unwelcome longing. The pantry is smaller than I remember, long and narrow and cool. The wallpaper is still messy daffodils, their orange and yellow now faded into shades of grey. There's a wooden table against the window, looking out into the back garden. When I lean against it to squeeze past, I run the pads of my fingers across scores and scuffs warmed by the morning sun. The cupboard is still there too. It takes up the entire southern end of the room. The latch lifts up as smoothly as if I'd last done it yesterday instead of nearly 20 years ago. The smell hits me first. It's entirely wrong gluey instead of musty. When my eyes adjust, I realise why. The whole of the vast cupboard's interior has been covered in cheap beige wallpaper. I drag over a stool, climb up into the cupboard, and with only the shortest of hesitations, start to smooth my palms over the paper. I half expect to find nothing at all, but when I feel the outline of something hard and metal, my heart skips a beat. I dig in my nails and rip the wallpaper away. Please be here. Please still be here. By the time I've torn most of the paper from the wall, I'm sweating, breathing too heavily. But there it is, as if it had never been hidden at all. A full-size quarter panel door with rusting hinges and two heavy slide bolts. The door to Mirrorland. Mm. Fantastic. <laughs> um, I, I, it really is quite the story. It's fantastic. And like we've said Thanks. already, there are there are lots of twists and turns in the story, and I feel like as when when I was reading it, um, and I think Kat, the main character, feels this way a little bit too. That uh, all the characters that she comes across, the ones that she didn't know, and even actually the ones that she did know, um, the, she doesn't really know who to trust, and finds it difficult to trust any of them. Really, as the story goes on, is that something you set out to try and achieve with characters that you, as, as you went on? Yeah, I. I really love unreliable narrators. Um, I love reading about them. I love writing about them. Um, I think as long as they're not really unreliable or really erratic, you know, um, I think you want to be kept in the dark, at least in the beginning. Um, but fairly quickly on, I think you want to feel like you're starting to learn things or um, uh, learn things about people learn things about character feel like you're moving forwards and I think it's um it's a very fine balance I like to write stories that have lots of numerous twists and turns and have lots of clues all the way through rather than the kind of story that you're kept in the dark all the way through until the very end when you get this huge big reveal that explains absolutely everything i'm not a big fan of that kind of book because <laughs> so much of it is a slog it's yeah. a slog to write but it's also a really big slog to read so i like um lots of little um changes as you go along and i think really that um 
if particularly um, with unreliable narrators, you you want to create um, you want to create mystery, you want to create suspense, but you and you want to create a reason for people to keep reading to find things out. But you also have to start revealing things um, a, a lot fairly early on. I think um, one of the best examples of an unreliable narrator that I've ever read is Gone Girl. Um, I think I think it's incredibly clever because it turns the kind of normal idea of an unreliable narrator on its head. You 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 read the book, um, the central character Amy. You have these. She's she is the narrator. It's first person. You 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 kind of believe all these things about her absolutely. You think she's a victim. You think that something awful has happened to her. Um, and then obviously by the end of the book, it's turned completely on its head, not just a wee bit, but absolutely 180 on its head. Mm. And I think another book um, that I read when I was quite young, but I think has really influenced how I write is I Am Legend by um, Richard Matheson. And I think it's really clever because it's, you think it's just a book about a guy who's um, the, a lone survivor or thinks he's a lone survivor in, in a kind of post pandemic world full of vampires. Um, he spends his days killing as, as many of them as he possibly can. And then his nights kind of barricaded in his house trying just to stay alive. And you think that's what the story is about. And then when you get to the end, when he's, um, he's, he's in prison, he's captured, he's, he's sort of facing his own end, and he realises sort of at once that he's not the goody in this book. You know, he's not the goody in this new world. He's the baddie. He's, um, you know, the legend. He's the boogeyman. He's the person that that is attacking everybody in the world he's he's the one that comes stalks you when you're at your most vulnerable and kills you um, and I think that's so clever because you it's very subtle and it's it's not like a huge twist where you go oh but it, it really makes you think because it does change the way that you think about him and the way you think about the world and in his in, in that book it's not him that's changed it's his environment has changed, it's his world that has changed, it's everybody else around him that's changed. Um, or, oh, I think I said this to you, I definitely said this to you last time, The Empire Strikes Back. I always think, <laughs> I always think, which film is it? And I always, I'm always convinced I'm gonna pick the wrong one. But the, the, the scene in, in The Empire Strikes Back when um, Darth Vader tells Luke Skywalker that he's it, he's his dad. That um, always, I remember when I was a kid, I was completely floored by that. But it's clever on two levels. It's clever because it's a twist that you never see coming. You don't even know a twist is coming or right. any kind of reveal, it just happens in the middle of this, this kind of action scene. But also it completely changes the way that you think about Darth Vader. You know, he's not just a kind of um, a cardboard cutout baddie. Um, he used to be someone else and he didn't just used to be someone else. He used to be a goodie, you know, mm -hmm. so it, it kind of forces you to, to think of him in a, in a completely different way from that point onwards, even when he goes on being a baddie. Um, and that's one of my sort of favorite things, really, when, when I'm writing is if I can change a reader's mind about either a person or persons or um, an event uh, or a situation, um, either really subtly where they realize when they get to the end of the book that they, they feel completely differently about someone than they did at the beginning, or whether it's through a kind of big reveal that completely changes something really fundamental about a, a character or about a situation on its head. I think that when I'm reading something, that's the kind of thing that I like to read um, and so, therefore, it's it's the kind of thing that I like to to write as well. Yeah, yeah, and that like, that, that kind of like shock reveal is definitely something that kind of really catches readers or viewers in the case of Star Wars uh, <laughs> uh, by surprise, and it really kind of adds to the story. I think as well. Now, in in Maryland, one of the other main characters is Ross, who is Elle's husband. 
Um, and but Kat has a bit of an unusual relationship with with him, doesn't she? Yeah, Ross was a really interesting um, character to write about. Uh, he's he's quite a complicated character, and he's one of these people that you're not sure um, whether he's a goodie or whether he's a baddie, or maybe if yeah. he's a bit of both. Definitely. You know, but at the <laughs> at the beginning of the of the book, when Kat comes back to the house, back to, to, to Scotland. He's really her only known quantity. He's the mm. only person that can tell her um, about what's happened. He's the only person that can explain what's happened in, in Elle's life for the past 12 years, because obviously she and Kat haven't spoken. Um, so she has to rely on him. And it becomes quite obvious fairly early on that that Kat and Ross have quite a considerable history themselves and that he is the main reason or certainly one of the reasons that, that Kat left um, for Ellie in the first place and, and one of the reasons that, that she and, and Elle don't speak. And I, I really love, um, well, I'm, we're already talking about Skinner Box earlier, but I do really love writing about love triangles. I think... I really love reading about them as well. I think that they're a really good way of getting people really invested, emotionally invested really quickly and really early on because they, everybody has an opinion mm -hmm. about affairs and infidelity and especially love triangles. You know, very quickly, if you're reading something that has one in, you've picked a side. You know, you, you want somebody to come out on top. You want somebody else to get their comeuppance. I really love revenge plots as well. And it's the same kind of dynamic, you know, that you, you really kind of get outraged pretty quickly. And so it's a good way to move a story along. It's also a really good way or, or vehicle of getting to know characters very quickly because love triangles... Um, and revenge plots are all about you know conflict and high emotion you know love and hate and betrayal and and secrets and all that kind of stuff so so I, I always knew that I really wanted to to write about one or the other or both. Fantastic and one of the things that I really loved about the book um, was the references in it to the Shawshank Redemption um, and Andy Dufresne um, which is one of my all-time favourite movies, um, and of course as a Stephen King novella as well. Um, what what made you want to include those in, in the book? Oh, um, I because I love Stephen King. I've always, always loved Stephen King. I think, he, well, I know he was my first kind of writer's crush. <laughs> I think I first started reading him around about 13, 14, and I think... I'm trying to remember what the first book that I actually read of his was. I think it was either Misery or um, The Shining. And I just, I really, really loved everything that he did. As soon as I kind of discovered him, everything that I wrote after that for years and years and years was me trying to be Stephen King. It was all in his voice. It was all his, you know, if, if I read a, a short story, I immediately wrote one that was almost identical. <laughs> kind of voice so I did that for for years and years and then like I said earlier he's also the reason that I started writing short stories um so he's kind of really influenced my career in lots and lots and lots of ways and I think one of the things that I don't know that I admire most about him is that he can um he can write in so many different genres um I don't think he's given a lot of credit for being a versatile writer, but he is, you know, he, he writes horror, obviously, but he also writes sci-fi and fantasy, um, crime fiction, psychological thrillers. He writes a lot of yeah. non-fiction. Um, but I think my favorite um, writing of his uh, is his sort of non-genre stuff. My favorite book, is this um, collection of four novellas called um, Different Seasons. And one of those novellas is Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption. And I remember reading it years and years and years and years ago. I've read it so many times I've lost count, but it's, it's really short. I mean, it's only about 100 to 110 pages, something like that. But it's just 
um, it's packed full of story. It's a perfect example of how he started in the middle of the action and, and just kept going. And it's um, it's seen as, well, I suppose it's seen as quite an uplifting story, quite a happy story. It's partly why it's become so successful. But, you know, about, I don't know, nine-tenths of it is really, really dark and, yeah. and quite sort of horrible to me. You know, it's all about injustice and corruption and abuse and um, institutionalization and you know it's a really sad story and it's mm -hmm. also of course about hope in the face of absolutely dreadful adversity and perseverance and and friendship and love and and redemption obviously but it's it's such a good book and every time I read it or every time I watch it I always feel all the same kind of emotions all the way through that I did um the first time that I read it and I just love it whenever I kind of sit down to to write something it's one of the stories that I have in my head because that's what I'm always trying to do I want readers to feel the kind of emotions that I felt when I was reading that book so yeah. so all sorts all, all at once and all the way through to the end um, and it's why or it's it's one of the reasons why I picked a quote um, from Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption for the the epigraph you know at the beginning of Mirrorland partly because it's such an influential book to me but also because it's 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 an important book to Cat and Ellen the story it's an integral part of the story and um, and it's why I was really, really, um, really, really chuffed when when he did a, a quote for the for the front cover, um, <laughs> <laughs> which was which was so strange. I remember um, my uh, U.S. publisher Scribner. I hadn't realised actually until I did um, a novel that publishers send out these uncorrected proofs to kind of high profile writers a few months before the hardback comes out or the paperback comes out um, in the hopes that they'll kind of read it and give you a quote for the front cover. I'm not sure I quite what I, how I thought they got there, you know, I'd never really thought about <laughs> it before, but um, so they sort of said to me, uh, oh, we're, sending, we're sending out um, some proofs to various writers and he, and he mentioned that they were sending it to Stephen King mostly because of this quote that I put at the, the front of the book and um, and I honestly didn't think anything of it because by that point um, some proofs had been sent out in the UK to a lot of writers and and we hadn't had any luck getting anybody to 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 read the book never mind anything else and I remember my um, UK editor had said because of the pandemic, this is bang in the middle of the think the first lockdown. Um, read, writers are just not doing it. They're being sent so many proofs that mm. they're just they just can't. You know, they're not reading them. They're, they're they're finding it hard enough to do their own work because obviously this was when people were having to look after their kids at home and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. It was just not happening. And I figured as well that Stephen King must be inundated um, with these kind of things. He must get hundreds, if not thousands, of them a month. So I genuinely didn't think about it. And then a couple of months after that, my US, or then US editor, um, Valerie Stiker, phoned me. And she never used to phone me ever, unless it was really good news or really bad. Really, really <laughs> bad. And I remember um, picking up the phone. And the first thing she said to me was, well, Stephen King's read the book. He really loves it. And he, he's, he's written a quote for it. And, and then she kind of read the quote out to me. And um, the first kind of line of it was, I loved Mirrorland, full stop. And then that was it. I didn't hear any of the rest. It was all just like quite noise. <laughs> she had to email me the whole thing afterwards. So it, it, it sounds really naff, but it, it almost meant as much to me as getting a publishing deal in the first place, because I can't, I can't describe how important a writer he is to me or how inspirational he's been to me not just in terms of this what he writes but also because of the the non-fiction books that he's written on writing the process and, mm -hmm. uh, and the publishing process and all that kind of stuff um it sort of feels like he's helped me 
all the way along you know even though <laughs> I've never met him I'm never likely to meet him you know it just it was it, it means so much and every time I kind of look at my book um I see sort of my name first which is great and then I see his name which is also really great it must be it must be a nice thing to kind of have that like put the person that you kind of idolize really and, mm. and can I also kind of pick up in your book and think this is really really good and get you that give you that fantastic feedback for sure it must be yeah. fantastic and it must also be kind of nice to kind of be able to see that on on the shelf seeing Stephen King's name next to yours on the, there too um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure it probably doesn't doesn't hinder anyone kind of picking it up I'm sure because it must attract a few people I'm sure to kind of picking up the book too Absolutely. if Stephen King likes it it must be worth it worth a look <laughs> for, for sure now, obviously, my land is out now, um, and that then come, comes back to the next big question of the next book after that, and the your website kind of hints a little bit towards you that you're working on your second book just now, um, and um, and it's an unusual murder mystery set in the Outer Hebrides. Um, can you really re- reveal a little bit more about that to us at all? Yeah, so it's um, it's called the Black House. Um, it's had about five different titles. <laughs> It keeps changing titles, but that's that's the final one, um, and it's set on a on a fictional um, satellite island, off the west coast of the Isle of Lewis and Harris in the Outer Hebrides, and um, I love um, the Outer Hebrides. I spent, gosh, it would have been in twenty. I'm awful at remembering things now. I think it was twenty eighteen. Um, I spent maybe about nine months living on the west coast of Lewis and that was where I did a lot of the sort of final writing of Mirrorland um, and it was also where I got the idea for this book and um, it's a it's a murder mystery like you said um, and it's it's kind of two stories that sort of are told side by side so the first story is um, a present day um, narrative and it's about a young woman called Maggie who, who goes to this, this fictional island to investigate the, um, the supposed murder of a young man called Robert um, 25 years before. And then the second story is told from Robert's perspective in the 1990s. So it's kind of telling his story, um, his life, um, all the way up until his his death, his murder. Um, and the <laughs> the unusual part of it, I'm not allowed to tell you. I've been <laughs> <to secrecy>. oh. <laughs> but um, it's to do with the very, very weird, strange reason why Maggie has come to this island to investigate um, mm. Robert's death. And the... Um, uh, there's a sort of a big reveal about that just in the opening chapter so it's not like it's that's that's the big sort of surprise it's, it's fairly <laughs> early on but um, the paperback of Mirrorland is out in January next year and they they told me uh, a few weeks ago that they're they're putting the first couple of chapters of the Black House at the end of that to so sort of fantastic. give people an idea of what it's about brilliant fantastic well, that's all the end of, end of my questions um i want to you know offer heather um a chance to give any questions if she has any um heather feel free to un- unmute yourself and and ask any questions to carol if you've got any yeah thank you carol um yeah i really enjoyed mirrorland i love that it, you can't really pigeonhole the genre for it i love stuff like that and um and just the kind of Claustroph- it was the house that did it for me mm-hmm. and I think when you were you were saying you know, this is a real house and these are the real plans of the rooms because for me like I, I did love a haunted house book um, so that was really the standout for me and that kind of claustrophobia of like I remember being like you described as well being a kid and Mm-hmm. like you're so focused on little spaces and you, you can't imagine whole worlds so that was something that really that really drew me in and I also love the plans love a book with maps and plans <laughs> <laughs> but I was wondering how did you come up with the names for the rooms like the donk shop and what was it the the Kakadu jungle yeah you... no I don't do, do you know, it was it was partly again to do with 
uh, my grandparents house. And thank you so much for saying that. By the way, originally I'd um, I'd wanted to make it like I, I love The Haunting of Hill House. It's one of my favourite books. And also I absolutely adored the TV series, which is kind of a very different beast. But originally my my idea had been to to set it in a house like that, you know, in the middle of nowhere, maybe in the Highlands or something, this great big sprawling mansion. But whenever I kind of sat down to write about it, it was just my grandparents' house I kept thinking of. And it's it's teeny, really. I mean, it was, it was just a really small house. But... Um, the rooms, I think, again, was to do with that house because the um, the Kakaru jungle, which is the the bedroom that Kat and Elle had when they were kids, it was the room that me and my wee sister used to sleep in, in, in my grandparents' house. And it had the, this mad wallpaper and it was like um, a jungle. Um, and it had all these kind of weird bird pictures everywhere as well. And the birds looked like they were in the jungle. So that was kind of where I got the idea for that room. And the the other room, the Clown Cafe, was where my cousins, um, Colin and Chris, used to sleep. It was across the landing. And it had, it looked like a Clown Cafe. You know, it had all these weird, multicoloured, stripy walls. Um, and it really kind of freaked me out, their room. I didn't like it at all. I much preferred ours. Um, the other two, the Princess Tower and the Donk Shop, were really just written purely on the basis of the characters of Grandpa and Mum in Mirrorland. Um, so they're, they're kind of entirely fictional, if you like. But the, the Princess Tower was my mum's room when she was growing up in that house I suppose there's that kind of connection and then the donk shop was in actual fact my grandparents bedroom as well so it's a bit weird see when see when I think about it it does sound a bit weird but <laughs> <laughs> it's just like part real and, and part completely fictional but um I think because I had in my head the whole time what that house looked like when I was a kid it meant that it was much easier for me to kind of let my imagination go free. And also because I had been a kid there, it automatically felt a lot younger. You know, I was able to create this fantasy world of Mirrorland because all my memories of that house are just from, from being a kid. Um, both um, my grandparents died in the 90s. They died quite young. So my memories of it are all from a very young age. I never mm. really got past a certain age in that house. So I think that also helped with how I was able to write about it, um, especially in the sort of past narrative from when they were children. Yeah, I was going to say, had, have you been back to the house being an adult or is it all, no, pure, is it all purely no. childhood memories? Yeah, I did. I did um, do Google Street Views. <laughs> oh, like yeah. Totally different now, completely different. Um, it was. It looks beautiful now compared to, to how it used to look. It was quite sad. <laughs> My godmother was like, "Why don't you just knock on the door and say, you know, do you know that this book is is based on your house?" But I think if I was them, yeah. that would really freak me out. <laughs> so. Yeah, maybe a wee bit. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I can kind of. Pick, I used to live in Leith, so I can. I can really picture where it might be. So <laughs> yeah, you should just post it through their door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just anonymously <laughs> leave it on their back step or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I think, uh, Heather, we got any other questions? We should probably get time for um, one, one more. I was just going to ask you, since it is Book Week Scotland, um, what kind of Scottish authors do you like reading? Is there any, anybody that oh, kind of stands out for you? I love um, Denise. i never quite sure. Is, is it Mina or Mina? Mina, I think, Mina. yeah. Um, I love her books. I remember reading Garnet Hill. Um, I think I was still living in Glasgow at the time. I was living not that far away from it. And I, I, I love her style of writing. Um, I love Val McDermott and Ian Rankin. Um, there was also a book that I read. I think I read it last year. I'm hopeless at remembering the names of people, which is awful. <laughs> um, called Pine. Oh, I've got that. I just got that out of the library. You see it on the shelf back there? Oh, is it? Really? (laughs) (laughs) 
what well, sorry is it Fran, Fran, Francine Toon Francine Toon that it, seems to be another one that people can't really pigeonhole no like, no yeah. no and I can see that it would yeah it would be difficult um, like Mirrorland, you know, for a publisher to know quite how to to market it, but it's a really good. It's again, it's the cool kind of atmosphere and the feeling. It is a very very Scottish book, and it's quite gothic feeling. And no, I really I really enjoyed it. Loved it. Yeah, that is a fantastic novel. If you've not read that one already, that's definitely a a good one to to have a look at as well for sure. Yep, I've got it on the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> In the pile. <laughs> the to be read pile. Yep. <laughs> fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Carol, for uh, the fantastic evening this, this evening. And, and thank you, Heather, for, for coming along as well to to uh, listen to us as well. Um, it's been a fantastic evening and I hope you both have enjoyed Bit Week Scotland so far and enjoy the rest of the, the week as well. Um, and it's that's a bit time for us. Thanks, guys. Yeah.